welcome back to another edition of Animal General with me, your host, Dr. Mike Hutchinson. Today I have two special guests here, actually three special guests, here in the studio. And one is a dog named Baxter that I think if you aren't on the website right now, if you're downloading this on Stitcher or iTunes, go to the website at some point and look at Baxter, a nine-month-old cloned puppy that you, would, you just have to see him. You have to meet him. It's just a little toy poodle, and I think you'll really enjoy that at DrMikeHutchinson.com. But I have as guests Dr. Sean Walker and Melaine Rodriguez, and they're from the company Viagen. Viagen is a cloning company, and I want to get into pet cloning, and it's a really good segue from my stem cell work and the um, talks that I've done on this podcast about stem cells, and if you haven't heard them, go back to podcast number two, and it will give you about an hour of what all of these stem cell talks mean, all the different types of stem cells, and what we're talking about, they're not all just embryonic stem cells. We have adult stem cells, we have pluripotent stem cells. Find out what that means in that podcast. I've been told by many people that it just allows you to, to get that vocabulary. So when you're speaking to your doctor or to your family veterinarian, you will actually have more information than probably 99% of the people on the planet in terms of the vocabulary. And I think that's very important that we all use the same definitions. But today, let's get into Viagen and pet cloning. And whatever you think about it, I actually am excited about the future in pet cloning and, and for a variety of reasons that we can get into in this discussion. But Dr. Sean Walker is, is a PhD scientist that has been working with this um, since, he, as he told me before the show, 1999. I think most people have heard about Dolly the Sheep, but let me talk um, to you, Dr. Walker, and to you, Melaine, about this technology with Viagen. And, and, and let's go, if you don't mind, going back to the beginning with Dolly the sheep and just tell the listeners um, what they did with Dolly. Um, so with Dolly was, was kind of the, the big breakthrough was it was the first time they used a cell that was actually differentiated to make an animal. And so they took a mammary cell and they basically developed a methodology for cloning and produced the first living animal from a differentiated cell. So they took a, a, one animal and made an identical twin or clone of that animal. Exactly. Is exactly what they did. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how they did that? Um, so the process would be very similar to what we use today. Uh, they would take and collect oocytes. Um, some people would just refer to them as eggs for simplicity. So the female a, egg. From the female egg. Uh, they remove the DNA just by actually aspiration. They remove the DNA. They take a cell. Go ahead. All right. So they do that by taking the nucleus out? Yes. That's how they remove the DNA. DNA. I think most people that know about cells... Um, know that there's a nucleus in the center, kind of the eye of the cell, if you will, and all the DNA is contained within that nucleus. So they remove that nucleus. But at that stage, it's not really membrane-brown, so it's more of a DNA. So, okay. so yeah, they remove the, the DNA. Um, they'll take a cell from the animal that they want clone that has the same genetic makeup of the original. Right. They'll put it back into that egg, and that egg will then reprogram that cell to give a fully DNA copy. We'll call it a twin separated in time wow. um, to the original. Wow, that's really interesting. So uh, just to understand it and explain it to the listening audience, the adult cell that they take from the, the donor animal, so if you have a pet or Dolly the sheep, they took it from, you said the mammary gland, so that was a, a somatic cell. And a somatic cell is just a cell that doesn't, it's not the sperm or the egg, it's, it's any other cell in the body. So they took a cell and they happened to take it from the mammary gland, that's hence the name Dolly, I guess, yep. the Dolly Parton, it was the joke of the scientist. But the, uh, they, they took the mammary cell and they took the DNA out of that, so that was an adult cell. Did they take the nucleus out, or did they just merge it? No, cell? typically uh, a lot of times it will be done. You can do it one of two ways. One would be uh, what you would call electrical fusion, and that's where you put the two cells, the egg and the cell, in contact and get an electric current, and those membranes will fuse, and it just dumps all the contents in the cell. Um, you can also do a direct injection where they'll actually take up the cell, they'll kind of break up the membrane, and then inject just the nucleus. And so there's two different methods that you could use to introduce it. Wow, that's really neat. So what, uh, can I ask, how, do, how does Viagen do it today, say in a dog? Um, so typically, most of what we do it would just be proprietary, and so we can't really talk about that. Okay, yeah. great. So, but you've, you've gotten the DNA from that donor animal, so if somebody has a pet, they know it's their pet's DNA that's that's resulting in that, that clone. Yeah, and then we'll just go back and genotype. So we'll basically take the cloned animal and then DNA match it back to the cell sample that they sent in originally. And so typically we'll have a blood sample or hair sample that uh, the individual's veterinarian will take, send in, sign off on, and so we know it's the original. And then that will be matched to the 
offspring or to the clone. So yesterday I was speaking to my wife about this interview coming up because I was excited about it. And, and, uh, and I said, what kind of questions do you think people have? And she said, she says, well, um, why would you clone an animal to begin with? Why would somebody want to clone an animal when there's so many unwanted pets out there? Do you have any, Melaine, let me go to you and see what you think about that. I, I think the, the common reason for all of our clients is love, this extreme love that they have for one pet that is a, a unique relationship that they may not have experienced with another pet. And I have the same feeling. I've got two dogs, and I love them both, but I have one that she's, she's my baby. Well, she's I there very special. Every pet owner out there listening is thinking of that pet right yeah. now. So it's, um, I agree, and I, th I think that is the reason. That's the reason I came up with it. I said, well, you know, I think of one of my dogs named Thorn. I just would love to have Thorn. You know, it's like when he died, I wasn't ready. So I'm sure a lot of people right. feel the same way. And they might have a short-lived relationship for reasons that they couldn't control. Maybe that poor pet was hit by a car, or maybe it got a sickness that um, was not a hereditary sickness. So, mm -hmm. so let me get into that, and I'm going to go back to you, um, Dr. Walker, with the hereditary nature of it. If I were going to do a, a, a clone of a pet, or I wanted to clone one of my pets, um, what are the likely traits to pass on that you guys have experience with? Can you give us some insight? So I would, I would go ahead and put that back on the lane because she has more um, interaction with the clients, and that's kind of who would be giving us feedback. We've been very amazed at how much the personality seems to be passed on genetically. Um, but like I said, she, go, she has most of that from a, from a pet standpoint to kind of get feedback on. All right, good. So I'll say some of our clients will say, My, the original dog passed away from a, a cancer. So does that mean the clone dog is going to have that same cancer? That's a question that I get quite a bit. And um, for that, we'll say it, it depends on the cause of the cancer. Was it genetically linked? Was it because of something in the environment? Um, if it was genetically linked in the original dog, then there's a potential that that clone dog could develop the same cancer. Um, but it's not to say that it definitely would. Yeah. Right. So, so as a veterinarian, if I were giving advice to a client asking about this, I would probably consider genetically based cancers as one of the negatives. When you're looking at pros and cons of doing things, that would be one of the cons. Um, obviously, none of us could say, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know if the envir what environmental factors mutated those genetically prone cells to, to become cancer. So we wouldn't have that answer as a definite, but that would be on the con side mm -hmm. if they had a genetic cancer. Okay, good. Um, how about personality? Well, so we can guarantee genetics. As Dr. Walker said, we do a DNA analysis and make sure that the original dog's DNA and the clone dog's DNA are a match. So we can guarantee that they're going to be genetically identical. Um, personality is something that can be affected by lots of different factors and can be affected by environment, but we really don't know how much of our personality is in, affected by the environment. So we can't guarantee that the personality is going to be the same. That's another very common question that we get. But based on the feedback that we've gotten from just about every client that has cloned their dog, it's, it's amazing. Um, there's some similarities that are just incredible, and I don't know how else to explain them other than maybe there's some link there. Uh, so that's, it's just incredible. That, that, that's satisfying to hear because I, I think we all look at that personality that we were attached to. How about um, things like color and, and uh, eye color, hair color, you know, coat color? Are those That's a very good question. Um, so it again depends on is there a genetic link there. So um, coat color, uh, let's say you've got a, a black dog with a, a white spot on the chest. Uh, the cloned dog should be black with a white spot on the chest, but that, or it could be somewhere else. That white spot might move around um, because where those cells land that produce those white hairs um, are dependent on the environment, so they can move around a little bit. So markings can be slightly different, um, but for the most part, the dogs are going to be um, typically the same size, body conformation is going to be very similar. Um, but markings can be a little bit different. Great. So for those of you listening, please go to DrMikeHutchinson.com at some point and, and have a look at this beautiful clone pet here with us in the studio. Baxter, uh, he's just, uh, he'll him out your heart. He's, it's a, uh, um, but it's a testament. Will we be able to get a picture of the, um, of the donor animal for Baxter so that we could look at those? differences? Is that something we could see? Possibly. Okay. Yeah, I'll so into that. We so be able we'll to. try to do that on the website as well as, as long as we can get that picture. And I, that would be up to the owner, I'm sure. So you can't say yes or no. I get that. So there, uh, but at any rate, you can certainly see the clone. You know, that's 
laying here like a teddy bear in, in <laughs> Dr. Walker's arms <laughs> on his lap. Just a very, very cute dog. Um, well, so the, so the personality we can't guarantee, but the clients that have had the clones are saying that they're seeing the link, which is really neat. The color we can't guarantee, and that makes sense because as a veterinarian, I can see melanin, which is the pigment that you know, is responsible for our tans. Um, some people are dark, some people aren't dark. Um, that melanin can develop later on in life. It can move around in the skin, and you can see different spots on different dogs developing with age. Um, but here's something that, that I'm curious about. A lot of people have heard about telomeres, and, and telomeres, um, for people listening, telomeres are just kind of tied to the longevity of a cell. So if I have a skin cell, it will keep multiplying. We shed skin periodically, and it will multiply, and I'll get new skin cells. You and I don't really notice it, except we might get a little dead skin that flakes away, and then we have a new skin cell there. Well, there's a telomere, or it's kind of like what some people have referred to as a shoestring, that as it gets shorter, it stops replicating, and that probably gets closer to end of life as those telomeres get shorter. Um, Dr. Walker, this might be more technical for you. Um, how does that pass on? If I take an older dog, for instance, say a 12-year-old dog, and I get a sample, is that going to affect it as opposed to a one-year-old dog? No, actually, the um, telomeres have been shown to be reset during their early development, and so uh, the more recent studies have shown that they have the same like telomeres as their original animal you would expect basically they they go back to a normal age well that's great news yeah. <laughs> so because that was the question that i was worried to hear a negative answer on so that's great news i i didn't know that so thank you for sharing that so what that means is that if your pet is 16 or your pet is two and you want to collect dna for the future it doesn't really matter that your pet's 16 is what you're saying right the, what the only thing we recommend is hey don't wait till an accident happens or you can't get it in and so try to be a little bit proactive with it right um and so that's about all we recommend but yeah we've we've had animals that were at the end of their life completely great long lifespans no issues and wonderful so. so so there's a question that comes to mind i was an er veterinarian for seven and a half years of my career and and i saw a lot of trauma and i saw a lot of accidents and and obviously those are unexpected um, what if that accident occurred and somebody's hearing this program and it happens to their animal and they're interested in cloning, how much time do they have or is it too late? It's not too late. Um, on our website, viagenpets.com, we have emergency biopsy instructions for this exact same scenario. So if you haven't had a chance to have the genetic preservation done prior to the pet passing away and you have an emergency situation, um, there's two important things and those are time and temperature. So you've got about a five-day window that the tissues remain viable, but that's if the tissues are refrigerated. So the most important thing a pet owner can do or a veterinarian can know to do is to refrigerate the body as soon as possible after the pet passes away. Don't freeze the body. That can damage the tissues. Um, refrigerate the body or take your pets to the veterinarian and have the vet take the samples as soon as possible and refrigerate those biopsy samples. and then contact us and ship them to us as soon as you can. But about a five-day window. Um, important though, don't, don't keep the body at room temperature. Um, try to get that body refrigerated just as soon as possible. Well, I will say that as, as a veterinarian, I was asked by one of my clients to preserve the DNA on one of their pets, and it was a very, very simple procedure within the skill set of every veterinarian on the planet to take tissue biopsies, punch biopsies basically, and send them off to have them preserved ahead of time. And it would even be simple post-mortem. None of us would prefer that, but it would be simple to do for any veterinarian on the planet. So even if your veterinarian hasn't had experience with this, um, a quick read, I will link your company's website to this podcast at drmikehutchinson.com um, so that you could, if you're interested, go to Viagen's website and read about what's in, and what it entails. So let me just ask a few questions about that. If I want to preserve the DNA, I'm not sure I want to clone my animal. Um, can I do that? Absolutely, and, and a lot of our clients are just preserving the DNA for now. So we do that through our service that's called Genetic Preservation. We have a biopsy kit, so if you're having the biopsy done on a living pet, um, call us. We'll ship a biopsy kit either directly to the veterinarian or directly to you. And this biopsy kit has everything that your veterinarian needs to take the biopsy samples. As you said, it's just a very simple punch biopsy, so there's a, a four millimeter punch biopsy tool in the kit. Um, all the vials and shipping material are in this kit and the return FedEx label to ship the samples back to us. So every, everything is there in that kit. Um, the biopsy can be done, it's a very simple procedure, it can be done under a local anesthesia right at the biopsy site, which is typically going to be 
the skin of the abdomen or the inner leg. It can really be skin from any part of the body. Um, so very simple process um, of general anesthesia could be done. So if the dog is having a dental cleaning and is going under anesthesia, that's a great time to think about having the biopsy done for genetic preservation at the same time. Well, you sound like a veterinarian now. That's what we do. We <laughs> say, hey, look, while we're doing the dental, let's right. take care of the rest yeah. of this stuff and uh, that we don't want to anesthetize them for normally, right. but we can add it on and, and uh, it makes it a very simple and, and likely time to do it, a very good time to do it.